Hello everyone and welcome back to Traditionally Speaking. My name is Tom and my good friend Joe and I are today going to be discussing a topic that I'm sure everyone enjoys every Christmas time and that of course is the Christmas Carol. And it's amazing. You're going to be so surprised where this all began and how it all started. And, you know, it's it's got a very long, very respectful history. And I think you're going to be surprised at some of the things we throw at you on, on this. So it's not, you know, it all started out not as the traditional carols that you know with, with the lyrics and the music and all of that but actually started out in, again, the Saturnalia and the winter solstice festivals and things like that, where they would dance around the trees and they would play music and stuff, but it was geared more toward reawakening the trees and bringing back the longer days and celebrating, you know, what was coming in spring. Yeah, I mean, that's perfectly true. Uh, when it comes to the traditional background to Christmas caroling as we know it today, um, you have the Roman Empire um, and Christians in the Roman Empire starting about 300, 400 AD um, with sort of musical celebrations of Christmas. But the traditional Christmas carol as we know it now doesn't start to take shape until about the 10th century. Um, and you have these plain song um, renditions of uh, you know celebrating the nativity um, which go up to around about 1200 AD or thereabouts um, and then you skip on to the Elizabethan era and suddenly it all starts to come into uh, in, into focus uh, in that 16th century period where you have all of these um, you know good Christian men rejoice Christ was born on Christmas Day, Good King Wenceslas, uh, yeah. all of these well-known tunes start to come into focus again. Um, and um, a few centuries down the line, you get to the 18th and 19th century, um, it really starts to gather momentum. Yeah, and what's amazing is, and you kind of skipped over this, and I don't want to miss this, back in the 1200s, 1223, St. Francis of Assisi, uh, is actually one of the modern uh, proponents of Christmas carols. And back at that time, they were still singing and, and, and speaking the uh, masses in Latin, which the common folk didn't know Latin. So <laughs> it kind of lost interest and in everything. And St. Francis started doing nativity plays and music and bringing it back in in the vernacular of the people, which allowed them to participate more and started to build that again. So actually, even St. Francis was the one that really got Christmas carols kicked off again. And then, as you said, you know, it, that's when it really started to spread into France and Spain and Germany and all the rest of the countries um, because it started to build from there. And then, as you mentioned, you know, I mean, 1410 is when uh, they came out with, I saw three ships. And, you know, um, and it's amazing how far back most of our carols go. In fact, the very first carol, if you want to really reach back, was 129 AD. And that was the angel's hymn that one of the bishops uh, brought into the mass which later became uh, Heart the Herald Angels Sing, and, you know, and then kind of grew from there, but yeah. I think because both of us are publishers, um, it's one of the things I like most about this is the fact that when literacy becomes more widespread in society and published books become more easily accessible, um, you start to see this big explosion in the 19th century of Christmas carols being circulated via books, so you have this kind of common notation, people are, are, are singing them to the same tunes, you know, there's not the same variation, and you have all of these favourites like The First Noel, um, mm -hmm. God, Very Gentleman, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, um, all of these songs start to, you know, become much more prominent in popular culture. Yeah, and it just continues to spread further and further, and what started out, I mean, carols were actually sung for all kinds of reasons, not Christmas originally, but it kind of focused in on Christmas and that's where it really spread. 
But <laughs> that is, except in one particular country, they had a little problem back in the 1600s, which kind of put the kibosh on everything. You want to talk about that, my dear friend? Because oh, you're, yeah. you're part of it. <laughs> yes, a, a, a topic a topic very close to my heart because it's here in good old Scotland. That's true. Um, <laughs> yes, during that period, um, Christmas was effectively banned um, because the, the National Church um, here in Scotland took a very dim view of anything that wasn't very literally in the Bible and Christmas as a celebration was not in the Bible um, and certainly anything that celebrated Christmas such as singing and dancing and sort of merrymaking um, these things were all forbidden so um, you would have members of the clergy um, you know creeping around the the neighborhood listening very carefully to see you know was somebody baking a Christmas cake was someone thinking about singing a Christmas carol um, and if they did, if they heard you singing a Christmas carol, you could be fined. Um, if you were if you were leading a group of carolers, um, you could technically be arrested as a, a public disorder offence. Uh, so you know it, it was it was taken very seriously for a long time. And it's amazing. I mean, Scotland carried that through for not just a few years, but literally hundreds of years. And you guys really didn't even get involved in some of the Christmas traditions until more recent times. Yeah, true. Uh, I mean, you were starting to see traditions, you know, not necessarily caroling, but you started to see traditions um, begin to revive to a lesser degree by the 19th century. But it tended to be only the very wealthy who would be celebrating Christmas. Everyone else, it was just a working day. Um, it's really not until the 20th century that things changed because uh, it became a public holiday about 1958, but it wasn't really observed until the early 70s. Uh, and even then, only because of letter writing campaigns by members of parliament saying, you know, everyone, everywhere else in the UK is having a holiday. Um, isn't it about time that Scotland joined the rest of the, the rest of the family of nations? Um, which they did eventually. And, uh, you know, and, and the things obviously became much more homogenized from, from then on. Well, you even said your father was working every Christmas every year um, because that's what was expected in yeah. Scotland. So I mean, you're talking about very recent times. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And it really wasn't until the 80s and 90s that you, you started to see that kind of harmonization um, of, of Christmas traditions between Scotland and its neighbours, um, whether that be in the UK or, you know, more broadly in, in terms of Europe. Well, and one of the things I found fascinating in looking this all up is, you know, when they first started with the carols, you know, a lot of the lower class people and the workers and the farmers and that kind of thing were singing the carols, not so much just for celebration, but they were going to the lords and the, the big banquets and they were singing there for payment. And mm -hmm. because, you know, it was a long time after you brought in the harvest before you were able to, to get paid again. So they would go around and they started caroling to, to different parties and banquets in order to, and a lot of the songs, you know, the, you know, like, um, here we go, Wassling and the Gloucester Wassel and that kind of thing were all to get payment. In fact, you know, we wish you a Merry Christmas. Now bring us some figgy pudding and bring it right here. You know, I mean, that was all to be paid for the services of, of singing, which, mm. you know, it's, it's kind of funny, but it really ran the gamut all through the years of different things that, that affected the caroling. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's interesting you say that because there has been, certainly in the last couple of decades, um, much more of a, a revival in those traditional Christmas carols because you get every December um, BBC Music magazine um, will have a cover mount compact disc um, and they will present an album of, you know, sometimes very traditional um, Christmas songs. You'll get things like Jesus Christ, the Apple Tree and, you know, yes. and very, very ancient carols. Um, and then on the other hand, you have, um, you know, well-known singers like Alexander Armstrong and Alan Jones and people like that um, who are popularising, um, you know, other songs like See Amid the Winter Snow. 
um, which had kind of fallen by the wayside and has now been revived again. So I mean, it's a good way, particularly for music historians, you know, to 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 have a look at these songs and realise that there, you know there is a story behind them, uh, and to, uh, to to really look into why some of them have stayed the test of time and why some have kind of faded from from popular use. Yeah, and one of the things I found so fascinating, and you've already mentioned, like, uh, Good Christian Men Rejoice and um, Ding Dong Merrily on High and Good King Lenselis. It's funny, the music for those existed back in the 1500s, mm -hmm. but the lyrics didn't appear until the 1800s. So hundreds of years later, they were playing all this music but they never put words to it until much later. And then they really, that's when, again, Christmas carols started to, to expand and go into different countries and different, and more people were adding lyrics to it and, you know, reviving a lot of these wonderful melodies and tunes that before didn't have words. Yeah, and, and then on other occasions, I mean, I think people often enjoy it if there is a story attached to a carol, and one of the favourites is Silent Night, um, yes. because it, it started uh, life um, as Stille Nacht, and it was um, Franz Gruber, who's in no way to be associated with the chap from, from Die Hard, um, who was a... <laughs> Who was a church Is minister. that why it's a Christmas movie? <laughs> one, one of many reasons. But, but he was a um, he, he was a, a church minister in Germany uh, in the nineteenth century, and originally uh, had wanted a carol that he could accompany with a guitar. Um, little realizing, of course, that the, the fame that that song would have, and of, of course, it's become a favorite of many in the years since. Yeah, there's a lot of people that started out that way, and you know, and, and they're, you know, I'm sure they're still looking from up high, going, "Really, that's still a thing, huh?" <laughs> but yes, obviously, one of our most cherished carols uh, during the year, and it, it's nice because obviously, it still takes place in churches, in schools, in neighborhoods, and that type of thing. And again, I'd like to ask our listeners. Do you participate in caroling or do you do anything or any kind of organized caroling or or do you just go out to like the malls and enjoy some of the beautiful music that they play there and some of the choirs and stuff that appear, which has always been a favorite of mine. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a shame we do so much online shopping because I think caroling is one of those things that's kind of fading out more and I think we need to bring that back and keep that tradition going for one thing it puts you in a wonderful Christmas mood but also it brings joy to others as well yeah absolutely and that's I think that's the amazing thing is you know, if you look on places like Spotify now you're having these um, eight bit computer remixes of uh, of Christmas carols, you're having um, Christmas carols that are um, that are being done in a medieval bard core style. Um, there's so many different interpretations. Well, yeah, and you look at some of the YouTube uh, videos that go on where they bring in like hundreds, sometimes even thousands, mm -hmm. of people singing these carols and such, and it's 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 a joy to watch, and it it just lightens your heart. And I think yeah. that's um, that's definitely a tradition we need to keep going yes so. and on that very note um that brings us to the longest ever christmas carol yes. um, <laughs> i've been doing a little bit of digging on this one and it turns out that apparently as of you know a few years ago certainly um the longest recognized christmas carol was written by a toronto musician called aj ing and it's called the 179 days of christmas um, it runs pretty much along the lines of the, the 12 days of Christmas that everyone knows and loves, but a little bit longer because the song lasts just over nine hours. A little bit longer? <laughs> I mean, by, I got to say, I, I think 12 days of Christmas is a great song, but I got to tell you, by the time that's over, I'm always so thankful. It's like, okay, well, finally we're done with that. 179 days. Yeah. Basically think, six months. <laughs> well, I think it's fair to say that 
you know, after nine hours, you probably deserve five gold rings and many other things besides. <laughs> I would like to know who could ever memorize that many verses. I mean, you'd obviously need reams of paper just to, to read it all off. So, or have it on your computer screen, just scrolling endlessly. So, <laughs> Wow. Now, has anybody actually recorded that or is it just out there? That's an interesting question because I don't think I've ever seen a full list of lyrics. Um, I know that it includes things like 132 darts with no dartboard, uh, <laughs> 70 unpaid interns, and uh, 101 golden retrievers amongst the many other lyrics that are in there well better than dalmatians maybe but you know 101 golden retrievers wow i no, thank you <laughs> and don't forget the partridge in a pear tree which i'm guessing is there by popular demand well i would have, i would have to think that was still included no matter what because you got to have some place to start but oh my god so well, there you have it, folks. If you really love Christmas, you've got a song that you can probably sing for nine hours or better uh, if you like to repeat the, the the verses. Good Lord. How would you even? Oh, no, I can't. Mm. Don't even want to think about how you would start at 179 and count down to what? I mean, that would be like impossible. But hey, I'm sure somebody will do it. Oh, yes. No doubt. There may even be a charity event there. Let's watch for the YouTube video. <laughs> <laughs> that could set some new records with YouTube, you know? So <laughs> but anyway, if you, if you want to look more into it, I invite you to look at... Uh, there's a lot on Christmas carols and, and their... Um, or, origins and how they spread and how different societies look at because not everybody looked at it the same way or used them the same way but you know they have certainly stood the test of time and i hope they continue to do that because as i said i think there's no better way to celebrate christmas and and the spirit of christmas uh and what it stands for than with christmas carols but what about everyone who's listening at home? Uh, are your favourite Christmas carols along the lines of Jingle Bells? Or do you prefer something a little bit more offbeat, like There is a Rose of Swich Vertu? Uh, whatever your your, uh, your taste may be, please contact us and let us know, because we'd love to hear from you. And how do they do that best, Tom? Well, they can contact us through our website, which is www traditionally hyphen speaking.com and we we really would we'd love to hear what your favorites are uh, mine change year to year it's funny i i mean there's there's some that, that are always in the top 10 of my list but then there's other ones that that i'll hear for the first time or some that are just kind of fun to listen to um and it just all of a sudden the list changes but We'd love to know what your favorites are and where do you sing them? Yeah, that's true because Christmas carolings never been more popular and it's a great way of people getting together at Christmas time. Yeah, and they can wear their ugliest sweater and sing Christmas carols. <laughs> well, at least it would be warm, you know, that's one thing that can be said for the Scottish weather, warm and you know, preferably waterproof. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, this is... is certainly one of my favorite topics and, and one that I dearly love and I hope we can continue those traditions and it's I mean nothing beats hearing a children's choir sing some of these and it certainly touches my heart and makes me feel happy so so keep the tradition going folks and really I mean we hope you, we would love to hear what your favorites are and we'd love to, to hear where you like to sing them so yeah. So thank you everyone for having joined us today. I hope that you've enjoyed hearing about Christmas carols and only time will tell what the next subject will be. There's only one way to find out and that's to tune in again soon. And make sure you tune in every 15th of the month because we'll have a new podcast for you to listen to. 
So we look forward to joining you again soon. Thanks again. Take care and we'll catch up with you soon. God bless. <laughs>